Nice. So we're still waiting for some people nice. to come in. Uh, we know that they're coming, it's just that they're late or cannot find this place, but we'll just begin anyway. Okay, so Mr. Tantem Hock, he graduated from the University of Malaya with a degree in Business Administration and Economics. He started his first trading business in 1985 at the very tender age of 24 and a half years old. He was nominated as the Ernst and, for the Ernst & Young Master Entrepreneur uh, as a finalist in 2009. So today, he is known as the founder of Alliance Cosmetics Group, which distributes brands including Revlon Cosmetics, which uh, all the ladies here should, have, should know about. He started the Silky Girl um, brand, including Silky for Men, um, back in 2005. And Silky Girl is now distributed in over a thousand counters in Malaysia, Jakarta, and Indonesia as well. And in 2.5 years, sales have exceeded that of Giants, L'Oreal, and Maybelline. So that's quite a, quite a feat. So today, Mr. Tatiam Hawk is also a columnist in the Star newspaper on entrepreneurship, and he has been involved in a huge array of businesses, which um, will allow him to, to, to tell us about later on. And he has been touted by the founder of BFM as the best marketer he has ever seen, and someone who really knows how to market products to anyone in the world. So please put your hands together for Mr. Tatiam Thank you. Um, well, let's go straight to the point. Uh, we're talking about entrepreneurship, and nowadays with the government being very involved in business, directly involved in business, and uh, how is that going to affect entrepreneurs like Victor, who wants to come out, you know, and start his own business? Um, just, just, just a brief background, uh, see whether you understand a little bit on things. You know, back home in Malaysia, who, who do you think, which organization do you think is the biggest organization in Malaysia? If you know or not, is it in the stock exchange? Which organization is the largest organization in Malaysia? The biggest organization is the federal government. <laughs> it's, true. it's true, isn't it? Federal government is the biggest. Right? What's in the federal government? You have the army, the police, teaching, teachers, the schools. What else? No. No? We're still talking about federal government. Right? Then you have all the ministries. Right? Under the ministries, you have so many, right? You have information, you have tourism, you have... And it goes on and on and on and on and on, right? And the civil service, under, under federal government, you have a civil service, right? Over one million employed. Malaysia is a small country. We only have about 28 million population. And very young population, so a lot of them in schools and stuff like that. Working population, maybe about 10 million, right? And one, one, one over million is, uh, is in the civil service. So more than one out of 10 is in the civil service. A civil service. So effectively, the federal government, the civil service, they are the number one organization in size. They are the number one consumer, right? They use more paper than everybody else. They have so many offices, right? They pay the most salary, right? They use the most computer system. They are McKinsey's favorite number one customer. <laughs> and they pay a huge amount of money to consulting firms, right? And the consulting firms, they make all their money from the government and the quasi-government and the GLCs, right? Because the private sector don't pay that kind of money. The government is willing to pay the kind of money. All right? The national blueprint. They go and give it to a consulting firm. All right? They pay 20 million ringgit for... I mean, they are not education experts, you know, but they come up with an education blueprint. Yeah. So, first thing you must understand, federal government is the biggest, single biggest organization, biggest customer, biggest purchaser of everything. <laughs> Right? If you are in business, you must always think of them as a customer. Right? Next, 
you come to your state government. Correct? You have a state government. <coughs> How many states do we have? We have 13 states. <laughs> <laughs> right? And each state have their own civil service. Correct? They have different departments, <coughs> but then state, they go a bit more down to earth, they collect revenue from you for your quick rent, they do the road cleaning, right? So they have a big team of people doing cleaning services, they're doing, you know, all kinds of stuff. Now, you combine this together, all right, huge. So all these years, what has the government been doing? They have been employing people. They have been giving jobs to the young. Who, if you don't give them the job, they will remain unemployed. Even that also, because of our education system, a lot of so-called misfits, that means those who study for something, right, not getting a job. Could be language problem, could be this. So what they do, they look to the government to be employed. Graduates, I'm talking about graduates. And they are waiting, looking for the government to be employed. Now, this is the furthest thing away from a Cambridge University graduate. Okay? You have no problem getting employed. But if you look back into our Malaysian education system, right, it's a huge problem as far as unemployment is concerned among the uh, grads. Now, normally in the old days, the federal government and the state government will normally be involved in what you call security issues, anything to do with national security, utilities, right? education, because you want to provide education to your, your people. Normally utilities like water, electricity, you know, those kind of things. And do provide all these uh, basic things, build roads and stuff like that. Right? Then they started going to business, right? that's business also, all right? building roads and everything, because you're giving out contracts. Correct? Now, then they started to say, look, you know, we need to go into business. Right? Then they came up with, state government come up with what they call the SEDCs, State Economic Development Corporation. They want to develop for the people. So those early days was very noble. We developed what we call low-cost housing for the poor people, you know, right? Uh, they go into uh, fisheries, okay, to help the fishermen. They go into, then they set up Felda, you know, national government, they set up Felda to help uh, open up all the rural areas and stuff like that. And it goes, this goes on and on. And those were the early days where the government, federal government and the state government, help the people build economically, right? And then it gets a little bit more sophisticated, all right? Because of our government policy as far as the racial, uh, what we call a balancing, in terms of economic balancing is concerned. So they started setting up PMB, right? What's PMB? Banana National Bahar, right? And those days, they said, okay, we are going to give equity to the mass Bumi Putra. Or else they will have no chance to own shares in the, uh, to have a share of the economy part, which is all the way good, all right? So they, they started off with unit trust, right? They start giving some unit trust, they say you come and invest, everything. Then they give a lot of special listing companies and special privileges to PNB so that they make money, that they can declare dividend, you know, 6 to 10 percent kind of thing in the early days, right, to give to the unit trust holders. Right? In a way, you distribute some wealth to them. Right? Then lately, because they have so much, keep issuing shares, that the Malays couldn't take out everything, so they also started issuing to other Malaysians. So some, some so-called limited portions are also given out for those you know, Chinese or Indians who have the money to go and invest. So there, there were some uh, so-called issuance of uh, this unit trust 
where the Chinese don't need to buy everything because they are guaranteed very good returns. Okay? All in all, good. Then PMB, to generate this kind of return, they started saying, what are we going to do? We have to start going in and buy all those good companies, right or not? Well, that, those are the companies that will give us steady returns. So they started going in. So PMB will go in and say, okay, I want to go into the property sector, right? I want to go into what sector, what sector, what sector, okay? So PMB's role is there. Now, so now property, they took over all those uh, tenement companies. This is what happened the last 10 years, right? They took over Palangi, they took over Patalin Garden, which was my partner's company. They took over uh, uh, Island and Peninsula. And the latest one, they just took over as SP Secure, right? The one that built the Fantasy. Uh, so they went in and controlled. They did a general offer, right? They raided the company, so they went and controlled. Now they're controlling more than 51% of the company. So they, by far, PNB is now the biggest property developer in the country by virtue of the size of the companies that they have acquired. Okay? So, is the government now, via PNB, involved in the business? Are they involved in the business? They yeah. are. Because these are all now, some of these are public listed companies, some of them are Sandra Bahas. They are now out there, they are building houses, buying land, they are uh, selling to the public. Right? So they are in competition with all the other property developers. Am I correct? Okay. Then the federal government, via the Ministry of Finance, MOF, right, started creating Kazana. Right now. So they give them grant now. Those early years, don't know, 10 million, 10 billion, 20 billion, 30 billion over the years, you know. So they started off, it's now a 150 billion ringgit company. That's what they say it's worth. Like, huh? They invest in CIMB Bank, they are in, you know, they're major shareholders in CIMB Bank, they are main bank, you know, da 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 da. Lots of companies, huh? right? Now, if you look at the, there's one more major uh, investor which is EPF. You know EPF? Yeah. Employee Provident Fund, yeah. right? So this one is for the workers. I work, I get a salary, I contribute, company contribute, right? It's for, for my old savings, right? Diamond savings, right? Yeah. Your parents have all contributed to EPF. So this EPF fund is now over 300 billion ringgit, right, over the years. It's very important that this one stay healthy and make enough money and give you a good dividend because this one is for all the workers, people, you know, and it's for your retirement age, okay. So this has nothing to do with the government, right. This is a workers fund. You have Kazana, you have PMB, the two kingpin. And MOF nowadays, come up with more funds, and come up with some new terms like uh, One Malaysia Development Berhad, you know what M M R D A B, right? And then <laughs> give a grant five billion, you know, right? Or one billion, and then they can go to the market and borrow money. So they borrow ten billion, right? So to buy back the power generating plants, okay? To go and invest in, uh, then they get a special piece of land. You know, in the city centre from the government, very cheap price. Then to, to, to buy all these things, they can they go and borrow 10 billion ringgit. Guaranteed by the federal government. Guaranteed by the federal government. Okay? So, now it gets a bit more complicated. Okay? So the political situation now is, some of the original intention of Looking after the government, uh, looking after the people, are still there. It's good. Some of the things that they go into now, into businesses, right? Every sector, you will go and look at every sector of the economy, whether you are in transportation, whether you are in uh, banking, finance, you are in uh, 
all the every sector is controlled. Okay, the majority of the big companies are controlled by either PMB, Kazana, or some of it by the SEDCs. Okay, I haven't gone to the SEDCs yet. Uh, which over the years also has evolved into a different kind of a business anymore. Okay, then you have, uh, of course, EPF is the mainstay, right, in terms of investment in all these uh, listed companies and everything. But the, 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 the fact that all the other sectors is being under control now. But later, we see a relay back as entrepreneurs. How are you going to survive? Right? So, then you come to SEDC. Who are the biggest SEDC? PKNS. Right? Which is Slango. Slango is the richest state in the country. Right? So, from building low cost housing, they also went into uh, different businesses now. So now, now they want to take over water supply. It's a big fight because it's now Pakatan versus uh, Amno. Right? So everybody wants to control things. Then you, Johor SEDC, very strong. They have a lot of hospitals, private hospitals. They control KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, for many years. Right? You have Sarawak SEDC, right? Then you have Thai SEDC, right? The Chief Minister's own company, Shahaya. You know, he's got like four, four big, four or five big companies controlling big, huge uh, amount of business. Right? And you have land, a lot of land, all the logging land. And so, it, you, you, what you have is a real mix. I mean, it's nothing different from Indonesia. Okay? Or, except for Singapore. Huh? <laughs> Thailand, Philippines, everything. Right? The ASEAN countries, the, you know, it's quite similar in many, many ways. Now, the fact that the government is being in, is involving itself in business cannot be denied, and there's no way it's going to change. Right? They're too far deep into the business now to let go, and it's all about economic power. It's all about control. Right? And nowadays it's very sensitive, right? If you go back now, right? They tell you, you know, you're, you're Chinese, Indian, you're not happy, you go home, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Right? The Malays must have the control on the economic power. Okay? It's all about political and economic power. They control now, last time they used to control politically, now they control economically. Okay? That doesn't mean as an entrepreneur you cannot survive. Right now. We all, anywhere we go, so we carry makan. We can make a living. <coughs> Right? But how much freedom do you have as an entrepreneur? What are the opportunities available to you? Okay? When you go into business in Malaysia. Now. I've gone I've never gone into a business where I need to depend on the government contract. Okay? I have never gone into business that I depend, need to depend on the government contract. That's why I'm never big. My business is never big. Okay? So, the entrepreneur of the year thing in 2009, five finalists, four Chinamen, okay? One Bumi Putra. This is nothing racial, huh? This is a fact, okay? Four Chinamen. So my turnover, 100, 100 million, 100 million. Then I look at the other three China men, 100 million, 200 million, 100 million, 200 million. You know, one was 50, 60 million, you know. I said, well, I've got China. Right? Because my profit very high. Cosmetic very high margin. I'm even willing to pay. We even willing to pay, I make money. So, right? okay. so then, this guy here, Sakura Kenchan. Oh, oh. <laughs> right? Then I read this. My father started Sakura, but he took it into oil and gas. Okay? So he got a lot of projects from Petronas. 
It's turned over 3 billion. <laughs> so I say, shit, it's my cash, it's my turnover. <laughs> How to compete? <laughs> Absolutely no chance. He was there. I saw, and I went for the function, you know, right? And we already know who the winner was. There was no end to it. Of course, before that, you had Tony Fernandez winning, you know, to be fair, right? A lot of good winners are Yo Tiong Le, YTL, you know, YTL was big, you know. So, so we were the small ones, you know, uh, but it was good. It was a good experience and stuff like that. So, if you are a, a, a Bumi Putra, it's the best time for you to be an entrepreneur. Okay? And you can really make it big if you join the right political party. You will be very, very successful if you have the right contact. And you'll make very, a lot of money very, very fast if you are willing to be the front man for the politicians. Okay? And that's a fact. So, if you have a Bumi Putra name, right, it's the best time now in Malaysia to go and go and try the luck. But if you are a China man, okay, then, you want to go into business, you want to go into the big contract, it's not a thing you cannot do. You've got to work with a good boomy partner. Okay, that's reality. Make sure you get a good boomy partner, right? They get the job, you do the work. Share the profits. Make sure he pays you. Right? Because when he gets the job, the payment goes to him first. Then only comes to you. So you make sure you get paid. Right? And that's another reality. And if you want to be in the big business, you also have to go into the right political party. Right? The only problem now is, for China men, there's no right political party. That's all dead. <laughs> <laughs> right? Gerakan dead, MCF dead, huh? all no strength. I'm not just slap everybody around. Okay? They say, they tell you, we don't need you, because you don't bring in the votes. So, if you want to go in from the political side, it can be a bit difficult at this moment. I'm just talking from the point of being an entrepreneur. Okay? If you are a businessman, you want to go in, you want to get the big jobs, you want to go into the big business, you know, go, get the right contracts and everything. Right? You need to go into a partnership with the public. Now, if you just want to sell gourmet burgers to young people of any race and you want to be in PJKL, by all means, go and open your gourmet burger, GBK, you know, Eaton gourmet burgers, you know, that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> uh, Wagyu beef, uh, whatever. You know. Nobody's going to stop you from doing that. But these are all small businesses. Alright? These are all small businesses. Amen? Correct? So you see a lot of people, everybody wants to develop an app. Okay? What's app is 19 billion, okay? I don't understand how to value the 19 billion. <laughs> okay? What's app? Oh, 19 billion. You know? But there are, I tell you, there are tons of people now developing, looking to develop that wonder app, you know. But none of them is making any money. Right? We're talking from Malaysia to Singapore to so many. So out of maybe 10,000, you might have one or two buggers lucky, you know, make some decent money out of it. But it's not easy. Now. So you have to be practical if you want to go into business. Right? If your family is already in business, it's a big help. Because that's one thing that you can go into, and then from there you start moving, you know, either you expand the business or you start moving sideways, or from there you use it as a base to go into another business. That, I think, is the fastest way to, to go into it. Right? If you want to start something new, and just brilliant idea, you know, right, you think like, uh, two, three of you sitting in the kopitiam and then, oh, I think this one, uh, you know, this one will work, right? Uh, see, nobody is doing it, you know. Uh, 
That one, uh, only three person uh, love the idea. You know what I mean? By the time you really do it, you might find yourself banging your head against the wall. And this is where, you know, Victor was talking to me, and I bought into BFM and, and I've been talking to uh, Malik. And one of the things you find out that a lot of people, especially young people, want to come and do home business because of this brilliant idea, right? And they waste two, three years of their time. Nine out of ten normally fail. If it's just born out of an idea which you think, yeah, you know, I think it's going to be there, you know, because it's not, nobody's doing it, right? The reason nobody's doing it is because it doesn't work. Have you thought of it the, the other way around? You know, just because you like it doesn't mean it's going to work, you know? So you have to be very careful in that, in that sense. Right? Not all ideas work well, right? Not all great ideas work well. Well, some is ahead of its time. You know? So in a way, when you, when, you, when you want to come out and do something on your own, we are going to start an entrepreneur club primarily because we feel that a lot of people, especially the younger ones, you need to have some good, solid advice you know, before you put your money and your time. So you know, more, all of you, you're, you don't need to work because your parents need the money, right? You don't need to give your money to your mom and dad every month. You need to? Don't need this name. Do you need to feed your parents? <laughs> yeah, our time, yes. I had to come out and work. Even before I get my results, immediately I did university, finished my exam. Within two weeks, I was getting a job already. I was working. What was I going to go and look after my parents? But you guys generally don't need. Jamie is never, he's not even, <laughs> see, I don't work. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so for your, you know, going to business, you know, and then, never mind, that can loan me a couple of hundred thousand. I've got this brilliant idea, I want to do something, right? I'm going to start a business. Hi guys, come, come, come. come. Right? I've got this brilliant idea and I, I think it might work. So I need to borrow a couple of hundred thousand from you. Right? You treat it as an advance now from my trust fund. <laughs> <laughs> okay? So the father, of course, you know, okay, you know, you're young, you know, you're young, you know, go and find out for yourself, you know, be a dumb dumb, doesn't matter, you know, waste one, two years of your time, you know, spend the money, go there, you know, after they learn that, you know, you'll be a smarter boy, you know. It doesn't work that way. Nah. <laughs> you waste two years of your bloody time, you talk about the money, you know, money isn't, right? But money could have been better well spent elsewhere. But the fact is you waste two years of your time. Learnings about something that you shouldn't have wasted your time on in the first place. Okay? Why do I want to spend two years of my time finding out that I'm in the wrong location, selling gourmet burgers to a clientele list that, you know, is never, was never there in the first place? What do I learn from that? <coughs> it's just I'm damn stupid, lah, you know, by not doing my research properly, by not knowing what to do. You know what I mean? So some, some things in business, you know, people say they work for experience, you learn from experience, everything. Yes and no. Right. Now, with the government getting so involved in business, right? The last bank not controlled by E, either EPF, EPF controls RHB. Okay? EPF controls RHB used to be controlled by uh, yeah. Thai family, yeah. yeah. Chaya. My <coughs> friend used to work for RHB, you know, so known the sun very well. You know, working under the sun very well. They say Canada. Yeah. So, but other than that, Kazana controls the rest of the banks, you know? Right? Maybank. CMB, you know, eventually. Now, you have the government controlling the banks, right? it's the wealth, as far as the Lee Kuan Yew and uh, Lee Hsien Loong is concerned, by uh, Lee Hsien Loong, of course, is the Cambridge uh, alumni, <laughs> <laughs> Trinity College, maths, uh, one of the brilliant maths and mathematicians, right? So, as far as they're concerned, 
I, I have friends in Temasek, as far as they're concerned, they are looking after the wealth of the country. Okay? They report everything out to the public, right? All the population, they know, the people in Singapore, they know what the Masih is doing, how much money they're making, how much money they're losing, right? And this money is, is a reserve for the, for the people, you know, for the country, right? I want to know what the hell they're doing with this, they're doing with this, they're doing with that, okay? I just don't understand. Now, this is nothing political, okay? We're talking as economists, they're talking as a concerned citizen, they're talking as an entrepreneur, right? I find it very difficult for me to go for all these big projects, all the government contracts, right? I'm a Malaysian. I set up a Malaysian company, I pay Malaysian taxes, I pay corporate tax, I pay personal tax, but I still cannot get a job. I cannot get contracts. Why? And this is the biggest customer huh, in the country. So, you're talking about political reality, you're talking about real business reality, right? And, you know, go and set up your own little music academy, music centre, you know, have a lot of students, do reasonably well, make a few hundred thousand a year, make one million a year, you know, live your life happily, pay your taxes, you know, right? Or, you're very ambitious, you want to be a big time entrepreneur, you want to go for it, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, you're going for business, you're going to go for it, right? You want to go regional, you want to go international, right? You want to be the biggest one in Malaysia, that kind of stuff, right? But because to be successful internationally, you have to be big in your own local market, right now. Right? Now, if I cannot be big in my local market, now I'm going to be big internationally. So I chose cosmetics now. Right now. And my main customers are Malays. 80% of my customers for Silky Girl are Malays because it's affordable. Right? And this thing about spreading the wealth, who are the poorest people? Still the Malays. The wealth hasn't trickled down. Okay? The wealth hasn't trickled down to the people. You don't get middle class. Like here, you're talking about middle class, right? Huh? Everybody is making 18,000, 20,000 pounds, 25,000 pounds a year, right now, all right? And then 30, 40,000 pounds. But 18, 20,000 pounds, they have a certain standard of living. Malaysia, the disparity is very, very high. And, and it's still, and it's still very much. It's still very much. <laughs> you, whatever business you want to do next time, uh, whatever entrepreneurship, you know, whatever, as an entrepreneur, whatever business you do, you do next time, you must always understand the social, economic, structure of the country, okay? There's a, there's a reason for it. Now, some, some pyramids are like this, right? So for a, a developed country, right? So you have the poor like this, right? And then you have the middle class like this, correct now? Very big middle class. These are normally developed countries. Then of course you have the Top end here. Uh, every country is the same, like, even US, UK, this top end uh, rich people is, uh, like, controls this portion of the wealth, you know. Right? But that's fine. Okay? What, what you want is you want you want to see this, this large thing here, this large middle class. Then you have really poor countries, right? And, and then you have like this. This is a poor, right? And then you have the middle class, and then you have the middle class. Okay? So, this, this, this portion here, 
this portion here, right? In Malaysia, unfortunately, it's still very rural. You go to Sabah, you go to Sarawak, correct? You still see a lot of poor people. Those people in the in the kampongs, in the uh, fishing village, and everything. You go to all the rural towns and everything, right? And you find that everybody's whole family is surviving for below thousand five ringgit a month. Now the children have grown up. If they're lucky, they get a factory job. You know, they get nine hundred minimum pay. Before that, they were getting five hundred, six hundred. You go to Sabah, Sarawak, especially the small town. Right, we employ the promoter girls. We don't pay them like what we pay in KL because cost of living, yeah, 300, 350 ringgit. You know, 400, 450 ringgit. Even in Brunei, they're still being paid 250 Brunei, 300 Brunei uh, dollars. You know what I mean? Right? So, so you, you, what you don't see is you look at the poor, uh, poor side of the thing. And when, when I was looking at the business for cosmetics, right? Who was the number one market? Number one, number one player was in direct selling. And direct selling was who? Avon. Avon was in the market for 35 years already. Right? When I, when I went to the cosmetic business. And then I go and check the Avon prices. Right? Their lipstick was 15 ringgit 90 cents. And their, their best sales is when you buy one free one. Okay? Buy one free one. You go to you go to all the small towns. You go to Sandakan. You go to you know Asari K, Miri, whatever everything. Right? Number one brand is A1. You go to all the small towns, and it's not because A1 is the most popular brand, right? because price, because they could distribute all the way there, right? And when you do this, your one lipstick is only seven ninety five. So that was my target. Right? And the other number was three times uh, Maybelline. So, when you're, when you're an entrepreneur, right, you understand the social economic uh, uh, structure of the country. You understand the government in, uh, involvement in the various business. Then you tell yourself, where do I want to be? Okay? Where do I want to be? Of course, we're just talking about developing an app. Then nothing to say that. You know, app is you're going to try your luck, right? Put everything into it, into it and then try to get some uh, people to invest in it and stuff like that, you know. Uh, that, that's a different story. Uh. But when you talk about basic, solid business, right? You're talking about food, you're talking about services, you're talking about, you know, uh, basic trading and, and manufacturing and stuff like that. Right? You want to manufacture things that are suitable for your status. Right? Uh, so like, I was just talking to an Indonesian friend here. Right? My friend is doing uh, uh, car parts. So, cannot get, cannot get a proton. Okay? Cannot get proton. China man. But he listed it, second board. He go into uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, second hand, you know, after sales. I uh, call it after sales. Correct. So we go to all these uh, Chinese workshop, everything lah. So there are dealers all over the country, right? And they stock up his parts lah. He will make lah. Uh, you want what you want? You want proton fender? I got proton fender. You want light? I got light. You know, you make all these parts, lah, right? And he got Toyota. He got this. He got that. Everything, right? Now he's expanded to. The Thailand and everything. He still doesn't have a proton contract. Right? But proton hasn't been that successful either. Correct now? Right? So, as far as this business is concerned, he still can do what? But he understands the market, you see. He knows where the needs are because people who can afford to buy a car need to have replacement. And they need a low cost replacement. So he had a low cost replacement. Right? And then a lot of, you know, the Malay population is very young population. So, you know, five children, seven children in the family, right? She got two, three girls. 
Correct now. All these are now 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, right now. Right? So you need cosmetics. Right? So there was a big boom in cosmetic business in the last 10 years. Because of the population going up. Alright. I, I just wanted to try to link an understanding of the government involvement. Alright? Link to the social economic situation to help you decide if you want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> you know, some basic things that you should think about before you even, you know. Like I said, if you just want to do a, a, a simple uh, home delivery service, you know, uh, finding an app for some, you know, aggregation of services or whatever it is, you know, that kind of things, you can do it anywhere. Whether Malaysia, Singapore, you know, it's not, not an issue, right? But if you want to be a serious businessman like this friend here, right? He wants to expand to Malaysia, he wants to, from Indonesia, and expand to Malaysia, everything. Then, you know, this will become very relevant for you, okay? And you're not going to get any proton business, <laughs> okay? Being an Indonesian. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, before it gets too deep, I, I thought maybe, you know, uh, well, an exchange of uh, questions that was on your mind, you know, I think maybe it's a very better approach to that. I hope I've given you some basic stuff to think about. You know. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, right. uh, so basically my question is about the next year AEC the ASEAN Economic Community in the sense that I believe by 2050 we are, we are able to move labors and goods and services between Southeast Asian countries easily uh, without any you know, barriers for fees. Um, what do you think about this? Is this going to be, is it going to make Malaysia a better place or is it going to make neighboring countries a better place? Um, if, if First thing is, there's a lot of still what you call, it's supposed to be free trade, but there's still a lot of what you call protectionism, okay? And one of the big, biggest problems, even from Rafida Aziz time, that means our previous trade minister time, was uh, protection for, for proton. Okay? And there was one of those issues that couldn't be resolved, you know? And it's just like, we can't, we can't open up, we can't open up. West Thailand is open up, Indonesia is open up, everything. You know? and there are a few other things which are so-called, what you call, protected by individual countries. Like Indonesia now, you have mining issues, you know, there are a lot of license pullback, and then you, know, you cannot export raw stuff. Then they stop sending sand to Singapore, you know. Singapore is sinking, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Singapore construction is really very affected, you know, uh, because all this sand was blocked, going aggregates and sand. And so you're going to find all these things, but the, the, the thing is, ASEAN is opening up, it's is, is no more a choice, it's no more a protectionism thing, you know, they have to open up, right? It has to be a population of six, it has to be a market of 600 million people, okay? It's about 600 million population for the whole ASEAN. Uh, and you're just going to see the whole market opening up. So it's no more, like I said, a Malaysian market. In fact, Malaysia to me now is very small. It's a 28 million population, even though you have a, a reasonably good disposable income, everything is, is considered small. Indonesia is by far, in 10 years, well, 5 years from now, it's going to overtake Malaysia. 10 years from now, it will overtake everybody in the region as a consumer market. Okay? Indonesia. Yeah. It's, a, it's a fantastic market. Okay? The only thing is, it's an outlaw market. It's, it's, it's a very difficult place to operate in, you know. Local governments are like cause, you know, the kings, you know. uh, and they have no no fixed policies. You know. they, they the, the damn policies. You know. I mean, you think Malaysia is bad? Malaysia is actually a, a very safe place to operate, you know. And and our, uh, you know, whatever you say about Amno politicians, they are the smartest lot. Okay, from early years, from 30 years back, they already know through political power they need to control economic power. You know, and they have been in control, right? And they, 
keep the, the people who are stupid to be stupid, so they continue to support them. Right? They are very, they are masters of, of their trade. Okay, they are very, very good. Okay, right? They are good in what they do. Now, back to you. So, so the ASEAN market is definitely opening up. It all depends on which sector. Okay, then you have individual certain countries still having protectionism policies. You know, like your, your, for instance, your car parts and everything. So Thailand is actually a very big market, right? Now Indonesia itself, locally, you are going to be defending because all the Thai people and the, the, the parts people from Malaysia are all going to Indonesia. My friend who, who's running this one is uh, opening a plant in Indonesia. You know, he's going to go into this after sales market. Uh, Hing, uh, Hing, Hong Fat, New Hong Fat. M-E-W-H-O-N-G-F-A-T-T -E is listed on the main board now. It's doing very well. It makes 30 million a year, 25 30 million a year. Right? Uh, uh, Judy's classmate. One year my junior. China. Uh, uh, so, this, 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 it all depends on it. But it's definitely going to be us. Yeah. So, if you, if you think now, we, are, we, are, we have been looking way beyond Malaysia already. In some of the things we want to do. Right? Even BFM, you know, uh, Mali is looking beyond Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at uh, having an ASEAN footprint, you know, having stations in Indonesia, stations in Manila, stations in Bangkok, you know. Right? So that it's an, it's an attractive for, for any company who wants to come in and buy a company, for instance, uh, having a station in all five, six countries, the key countries, uh, you know. So, so things like this. Uh, Right. For us, opening Indonesia was very important for Silky Girl. Right? So we, got, uh, we hired Gita Kutawa to be our, our thing. And so we've been losing our pants for the last three years. But it was very important for us to establish ourselves. So uh, we've grown ourselves in Matahari now. We're in 70 stores in Matahari. Uh, we have gone up to like number 9, number 10 brand, you know, in uh, out of 30 brands. You know, over a short period of two years, you know. So, it's a lot of investment, and, and, but it was an important footprint for us because we're in Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei, now we want Indonesia, you know. Right. So, things like this. Uh, business depends on where you go. Uh. Last time, we were not allowed to own 100% of a trading company. Uh, but three years ago, they opened up in Jakarta. So, we went and set up our own 100% own subsidiary, and then we would start trading, you know. We just start trading. And then we got cheated and got cheated and got cheated. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> it's, it's tough. Going to another country is tough. Especially if you don't get the right partners or you don't, you don't have to hire the right people. You know. Even if you hire the right people, also it's tough. But that's what life is all about, right? you know, if you are in business. You know, and you've got to take some risks. Just make sure always your home market you're doing well or wherever you're doing you're always doing well so your base is strong always right then you take some money and invest elsewhere you know that's for the future okay one question next yes um, it's not, I, I'm, I'm a Singaporean yes so uh, I, I gave you two points in that um, it's not a business you should focus on basic business and number two you start your home market so for me as a Singaporean um, the Singapore market to me seems like no market at all. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, so I think actually that's a practical advice you can have for me if I will be an entrepreneur. So logically, you know, following your advice of the start in Singapore. So what you have to do is I said it, it, it all depends on what do you want to do. You know? Uh, if if you are in services, for instance, if you are in services, um, Singapore is a good place to start. Hong Kong is a great place to start because they value services. They are willing to pay for services, you know, right? And if you are in food, right? Singapore is a terrible place to start <laughs> because you are torn. You are stuck between the hawker. And you're stuck between those uh, already very established players who have multiple brands and multiple shops. And the rental there is killing. Singapore is going to be a very, very tough market for food operators or for retail shops to operate in. Okay? 
right? Because it's just gone up too much in terms of cost. Hong Kong has very high rental cost, but the turnover is fantastic because the Chinese, the Chinese people have gone there, and the turnover per shop is so much higher than anywhere. You know? It's a really, really a top retail destination. And, and you need to have high velocity, you know, to cover your high rental. Right? So you have, when you're in Singapore, you have to be very careful with your, with your overheads, with your fixed costs. Right? Your rental cost is a killer and, and stuff like that. So it all depends on what you're going in. You know? If you are doing services and stuff like that, you don't need a big space. Right? Right, uh. By the way, what are you studying? Um, Chemical engineering. Uh, there are not that many jobs that are, you know, in Singapore in terms of uh, engineering side. Uh, right? uh, but they are, they are, they are quite, they, they have moved themselves into very high value added industries. So if you, uh, I think the chemical side, well, actually to be fair, chemical side they are quite strong. Right? They, 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 they've got into strong uh, high end industries and stuff like that. Your business, what kind of business do you want to do? Are you going to do engineering services or you want to do something else? Uh, no, okay. no, okay, I do. Okay. So, I want to ask you a question. Some of you know you want to go into business. I have no idea what business to do. But I know I want to go into business. Correct? <laughs> you, know, you, know, you know where you're going. You don't know where you're going, right? But, right, right. Uh, yeah, but you want to go into business, right? Same thing for you. Right? You want to go into business, but you don't know where you're going. You also, right? You want to go into business, but you don't know where you're going. You also, right? You also, right? And you don't want to set up your own legal firm, right? You're going to go to Cambridge, you're going to go, you're going to go all these things, right? You know? right? So, what do you think should happen first? Should you go and work first? Or should you just continue dreaming about what you want to do? And then start looking for things to do or what? You know what I mean? I, I, I'm, I'm, that I'm a bit lost now. So what do you do? Right? Then you say you're going to graduate. Then you say I'm, I'm going to go. You want to go in London? I, I, I have a job. You already have a job in London as a chemical engineer. <laughs> <laughs> as a banker. Okay, interesting. No, but it's, it's nothing, nothing new. Uh, banks love to hire engineers. It's the latest trend. Okay, banks love to hire engineers because they think they are very good. Um, primarily because it's very hard for them to get mathematicians to go into banking. So, <laughs> the best thing is engineering. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but engineers are, are very good. You know, technically they are very good. They have a very good, uh, what do you call it, uh, analytical mind, uh, especially for complex cases. And then now, now some of the some of the financing have gone into project financing and stuff like that. You know, oil and gas and stuff like that. So you need to have a bit of engineering background, right, to understand, you know, to to to, to evaluate the case, and, uh, the projects and everything. So engineers are in high demand as far as banks are concerned, and it, it's easy to train you uh, to understand about financials, right? But it's, it's difficult to train you with your basic engineering skills. You understand what I'm saying? Right? So, in a sense, you know, I have friends who are from engineer also, Manchester, civil engineering, went to banking. After two, three years of working as an engineer, he gave up, went to bank, has been in banking all these, all these years. You know? right? Now, so you've got a job in London, you're going to continue working, and then you start thinking about what you want to do. What business you want to do? Uh, thinking now. So are you going to start your job first? Or? Yes. Are you going to start your job first? I'm actually thinking something, a service industry of new value added since I'm working in the financial services sector in South Asia. What's your view on market for? You know when you, you want to offer your services, right? It means basically you're offering skills. Right, a skill, certain skill set uh, that other people don't have, uh, right, uh, or other people need from you. Uh. So if you haven't worked for people yet, what kind of skill sets do you, can you offer to people? I'm from Cambridge. <laughs> 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 I offer you my brains! <laughs> <laughs> you 
you, you, you understand what I'm saying? So, if you want to go into services, then you have to, you, when you say you want to go into some, but financial engineering services, I don't know, I, let's just say, okay, you want to all, offer some software, you want to also offer some techniques, or whatever it is, you have to work first, right? Gain experience in the, rele in the relevant field and stuff like that. Correct or not? Like this cousin of ours, uh, uh, the husband was a civil engineer, went and worked for this company uh, uh, consulting firm, which uh, does, uh, what do you call that? Um, Jim is doing those, uh, uh, they go and inspect, you know, whether the building are going to be rotten or whatever. Sorry? Safety. Safety. Yeah. Inspections and Safety inspections and stuff like that. So that's a very specialized field, you know. That means you can go to a wharf, you know, and, and then go dive in and then go and look at the structure and see whether you need to repair, you know, that kind of stuff. The old building, you know, uh, where it's going to be rotten or you know, how to be strengthened. Some building unsafe, you know, have to be, go in and then see what to, to repair and make it safe. So as a consultant, uh, right? So he worked for some years with this. Before he came out, he set up his own. Uh, we had, we some, we had, we had another partner from the same company pull out and then they started their own. So they've been in their business, you know. So in that way, you start your own business, being your own entrepreneur, by go being involved in services which you have experience in. Right? That's one, that's one way. You know. The other way is, you know, already family business is there. Right? You go in, you know, expand the business, take it regional. Right? And you start by learning going back to the home market and learning all the tricks and tricks. Right? right? And then, you know, you might want to go into a bit more into manufacturing, you know, and then setting up hubs everywhere, that kind of stuff, you know, to service your customers, you know, that kind of thing. So, every, everybody is different. Uh, but the pure idea is like, everybody is waiting for the big idea, you know, what to do, what to do. Then you mix with the friends of the same thinking. Right? And every time going for your Oh, in Singapore, no te tarik. Uh, Singapore, we go to mama shop. <laughs> no, I don't have. Uh, Kopitiam. Uh, go to Kopitiam with friends and then chit chat. But you're going to be in London. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't see how you need to go back to Singapore to start up something. Unless you have specific skills you know, to, to take back to Singapore to offer in the sense. Uh, any other questions? Yes. A quick follow up. When you say just now, um, like for example, I want to go back to Indonesia and start up a business. Let's say, uh, do you think it's a good idea to actually explore the world in the relevant industries, or rather going back straight away to Indonesia, learn the local markets, and then start from there on? Um, you know, in in, in business. For us, uh, I do a training business. Uh. As a distributor, uh, I just give you a few, uh, what do you call it? Rule of thumb. As a distributor, let's uh, just say you go back and you start taking uh, products from different automated suppliers uh, to be their, dis their agent uh, in Indonesia. Uh. When you are a distributor, you must make money from day one. Because it's not your bread. Okay? Straight away you must make money. Bring in, sell, make sure you make money. Right? No such thing as investing so much, you know, and then waiting slowly to collect. Right? But then if you are in the car distribution business, it's a different game. Because they want you to invest in a 4S service center, which will put you back two million US, right? And then you've got to stock up on so many cars, right? And you've got to hire the mechanics, you've got to build the whole 4S center, you know, that kind of stuff. And then only you start doing the thing. But generally, because they are well-known brand, there's a certain turnover. Lah. So you have a good chance of making back your money. Lah. Right? Now, then you say you want to go into whether you should go back to your home country. Big risk. They say 8 out of 10 will fail. One out of ten doesn't know what the hell is happening, right? And the other one, totally 
zong, blur. You know? So, out of 10, maybe one fellow get lucky, my survivor. You know? And this fellow survive, start learning, oh yeah, I can make money this way. And then from there, he keep turning, keep changing. Right? Keep evolving. So from your original idea to the idea that makes money, it's actually a journey. There's no such thing as Google, you know, wow, I got this idea, Facebook, I got this idea, and then from there, uh, straight away, making me so much money, right? Facebook also evolved, right now. Facebook started as college only, right? right? And then it just keep evolving, 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 uh, based on the market, right? Now, right? What you want is the world market, right? So it keeps evolving, you know. But you have to start somewhere, right? And when you start somewhere, you've got to make sure you can survive. Who's going to pay a salary? Who's going to pay the staff? Who's going to pay for the office? So your original idea must still have turnover, must still have some sales. Right now. Everything is sales, you know. Right? I don't care whether you're an engineer, you're a maths, you're an economist, you're whatever it is. Right? Everything is selling, you know. So don't think selling is bad. You need to sell. You need to sell your services. You need to sell products. You need to sell your music services. You need to your your skills, your, your teaching skills. You know, you need to sell everything. So everything is sales, right? Now the unit still sell to sell. They want the students, right? They want paying students, right? So they want to sell also. So when you start your business. Wherever you are, whether it's Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, everything, is it easy to start? Can you survive? Mm. Uh, maybe go home easier, right? Go home for base already, you know. I uh, can use father's office, right? I can use uh, the secretary. I got driver there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to print my, just register a company, print my letterhead, I use my father's address first. Okay, right? And then, never mind, you can stay at home also. Hey, oh, at home, got, got meat, la. got cooked some more. Oh, so nice, you know. Oh, then I have 100% free mind to concentrate on my new business. Look, you know, my big aunt, I come from a poor family, but my uncles are very successful. Right? My big aunt, the, the, the son and the daughter-in-law, Reliance Travel. Right? My uncle is a IGB. Okay? Mid Valley, you know, you know IGB Corporation. You know, a big, 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 big developer. My partner, Pertaring Garden, you know, all very rich. I poor Chinaman, you know. 24 and a half years old, gotta come out and sell visa bits. Okay? But, I have to survive in the beginning. Even though, you know, I have everything you have to do, and then I just keep evolving. So, how did I evolve? I started whatever I could get agency on and get first. Razor blade, then razor blade, check, check, check. Very small business. Uh. Gillette, uh, hammer me. Right, uh. Gillette control 80% of the market. Then from there, I went into uh, food product. We took agencies, Fisherman Friend, B and Perry Sauce, HP Sauce. Okay? 1986, 87. So I have a partners doing, helping me doing that. Okay? Then I went to start a rubber grill business. Manufacturing, 87. You know? Then, 94, we sold the fisherman friend business, the trading business. Yeah. I made my first million, 34 years old. So I was late by four years. I, I wanted to make my first million in here when I was 30 years old. That was my dream in the university. I like, yeah, I want to come on. I must do business. Now. I cannot work for people. <laughs> really, I cannot work for people. You know, I'm like that. What to do? Don't listen, don't attend lectures, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> And then, from there, I walk. Then I do all this food business. Huh? Food huh, is 12 month uh, expiry date. Huh? 
from the day manufacturing uh, to the day uh, where it's expired. Then a uh, supermarket, uh, three months before cold storage, uh, three months before uh, expiry date, uh, don't send me, uh, I reject. Correct? Uh? Because you're selling it, going to be expired stock, you no, know, customer won't buy. Right? So I only have nine months, you know. Shipping from London, uh, okay, go there, 30 days plus clearing. Uh, are you? Right? I lost one month already. So I got 11 months, I got 3 months, I got left with what? 8 months selling period. Some flavors can sell, no problem. Some flavors cannot sell, stuck. Right now. Then margin 30%. You know, call it minus this, minus this, all the expenses, everything. I end up making 2-3% profit margin. So I evolve. Right? I start going to, I start looking for high margin business. That's why I ended up with cosmetics. Because I wanted a high margin business. So your entrepreneurial journey, you know, your, your, your business journey, but I say you start with an idea, and this idea, by the time you are successful, is totally changing. You have forgotten what the hell you were thinking about in the first place. Because this idea probably doesn't work uh, as well, right? It's, but it's a start. So for this starting idea, you make sure you can survive, you can make some money. You know? Because you might not need to give money to your parents, but your parents won't be giving you any more money. You have to survive on your own. Right? At best, you can go move back and stay with them. They still provide you with the food and the maid, everything, but then you know, you'll be too embarrassed to ask them for more pocket money, isn't it? And you're out and doing your own business. Huh, Jimmy? <laughs> <laughs> So I have food for thought, okay? Just, just that, you know, when you want to do something, for me, if you have a family business, no harm. Right, back to the story. So my big aunt, you know, when I became successful in my trade business, everything, so she, she knows how, how poor my family was last time. So she came and she saw me and everything. She said, you know, you're so good, you know, right? by yourself, you know, you're so successful and, and you know, you build yourself a business and you build yourself some wealth and everything. So my cousin, who is Tan and Tan, uh, the, the eldest son is uh, Wun Sing. Uh, okay? He's Oxford or Cambridge? Cambridge as well. Um, so he's Cambridge, Master of Arts. <laughs> <laughs> I know Master of Arts. So he's cut. Um, so my big aunt said, well, 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 I said, Toko, you know, by big aunt. Uh, Right? See, Toko. See, I would rather be Boon Singh's position. You know? That means you start off with wealth. And then you go into business, then you do bigger business. You know? I spent 20 years to build up a business so that I can be in a position to do some decent business. Right? He straight away start off on a, on a different level. You know? Right? I'm doing $1 million business when I start. He is doing hundred million dollar business. Which position would you rather be in? I'm not there. Correct or not? Right? That's logical. So if you have a family business to go back to, go back. I want to do my own business. I want to try this now and that. Waste time. Really? Okay? Swallow your pride. Let your father ng 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 you a bit. Never mind. <laughs> right now. He only wants the best for you. You know what I mean? Wisdom. And then it's also a bit difficult for him to let go uh, so fast. You know what I mean? I want to test you and see how you do first. You know? Normal stuff. Okay? But if you have a family business plan to go back to and use it as a base, you know, then later when you have more experience, you're on your own, you can do anything you want. You want to expand it, you want to grow it, you want to go into a totally different business, that's up to you. Because you already have the feel. You already begin to understand about market, about the social economic status, about where you want to go. Okay? In, in the business. Right? Okay? Just one last thing. The one I need a value chain. Okay? So I should try to go a bit on this one. This one I did in the BFM, the, one of those management courses, 
lunch talk. Okay. Let us say the lipstick is being sold for 20 ringgit. This is the retail part. Right? 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 So consumer price, you go to the shop, you buy 20 ringgit. Then you buy from uh, say uh, boots. Boots make 35% margin for each 20 ringgit. So boots make 7 ringgit. Right? Oh, pounds are in the UK. <laughs> uh, so boots make 7 pounds. The boots cost is 13 pounds. Correct? Uh, pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Both make seven pounds only, right? Thirteen pounds. So the distributor here is, uh, let's just say, our Singaporean here. Right? So Sing Incorporated. Right? Sing Incorporated cosmetic business you make seventy percent money. Seventy percent. From thirteen UK you make seventy percent. Why? Because you got to spend a lot of money hiring models, you know. Spokesperson, normally famous people, so you will pay a lot of money. Right? You will spend a lot of money advertising, producing commercials. Right? You need to have promoter girls, build counters, invest a lot of things. You know? So you need a lot of margin to sustain. Okay? So you have 70% margin. 70% of the 13 is how much? So, 390. This 70% of this is how much? 91. 910. Right? Right now, like that. Okay? And then you have what you call manufacturing. You have to buy from manufacturing, isn't it? Right? Manufacturing normally makes 20% profit. Quite standard one. Okay? 20% profit. So manufacturing makes 20% of this 78 cents. Pence. Right? And then the rest of it is raw materials. You know, buy all the raw materials to put together into a lipstick. Right? Now, this whole process here is called the value chain. Value chain. Why is it called value chain? Because from here you build up the whole thing, one lipstick, manufacturing, right? And then all the way to the consumer price to create what you call a value chain. Now, this is a uh, cheap plan. I only sell 20, 20 pounds of lipstick. Then you have Chanel lipstick. Right? How much you pay for Chanel lipstick? 100 pounds? Correct? Right? right? You pay 100 pounds in it. Five times, huh? Easy, huh? The production cost, this production cost is three pound twelve, right? They have production cost they could go casing uh, this uh, that uh, maybe double uh, right? But they sell hundred. <laughs> so now they are very keen, all the way to hundred. My very keen only all the way to twenty. So again, the, the, uh, John Lewis makes 35% from 100. So you tell me John Lewis want a sandwich man? Sandwich one lah. So easy to make one, right? Make 25% is 35 pounds. Right now, rather than selling silky girl. Right? Then, Sting Incorporated, wow, wow, I like more to do this business. Right? <laughs> right now, now I've got 70% of uh, 100. Or rather 70% of the 70. 49. I mean 49 pounds, not 9, 9, 10 only. Okay? Now, why? What's the significance of the value chain? There are a few things you have to look at when you want to go into business. Okay? You go to any business now, right? You think, lah, you want to go into any business now. Which part of the value chain are you? What do you want to do an example? 
Anybody want to come up with an example? Say you're going to do a certain business. Why? Do you want to be just now boots? Do you want to be seen, incorporated? 